uh, what a much easier problem than, uh, than Sergei's talking about, which is if we had a quantum computer, what would we do with it? Um, and I started this, I started the theorist a while ago, and when I did, working on theory was a, was a fun topic that was very far away from what experimentalists were doing. And we're entering an exciting time when theory and experiment are getting a lot closer. And so before we used to focus on what could we do with an asymptotically large quantum computer, now we're starting to think about what can we do with the quantum computers we will have in the next, in the next few years. Actually, even before you go on, I want to thank uh, Emmanuel and, and Daniela for organizing this and, and for inviting me and also, also Krista. So uh, it's, a, it's been a great pleasure to be here and I've, I've enjoyed it a lot. Uh, and I am going to tell you about, about this, this area of why we're studying, you know, what we're looking for in, in quantum algorithms. And I want to point out a few things about the motivation. I think maybe are a little bit obvious that uh, computers have great economic and social value. We get a lot out of them. And uh, we've sort of taken for granted this Moore's law for a long time. Uh, and we know it has to pretty soon end. Uh, the exact details of the end are a little bit fuzzy, but we know that they, at some point, uh, before your transistor is smaller than a hydrogen atom, uh, it's going to end, and, and that point is coming pretty soon. So, uh, on a practical level, we'd like to know what we can get out of these devices. In the long run, we want to know how valuable they'll be, and in the, the near term, we want to motivate building large quantum computers, so we want to be able to do something useful, or at least uh, a demonstration of something interesting with a, a 50 to 100 qubit quantum computer. Um, but there's a more basic reason, at least that got me into the field, which is quantum computing tells us a little bit about the nature of information and computing. These are, are topics that seem like they're maybe the domain of, of logic or philosophy. You know, information, you don't, doesn't seem like you, need, you should need to know physics to know what information is. Or computing means you're manipulating symbols, you're manipulating ideas, mathematical propositions, Again, that seems like a purely abstract idea. You don't need contact with experimental physics to, to actually inform what that is. And so when quantum mechanics tells us things like the uncertainty principle, that you cannot know, the more you know about this thing, the less you can know about this other thing. Uh, or entanglement, that the whole is, is more than just the sum of its parts. That's a, a real radical, in my view, departure from our common sense notion of information. And People have discussed it philosophically for a long time. What quantum computing tries to do is discuss it operationally, to say, with this wacky alternate form of, of information, what can we do with it? And, and I think what, studying the examples of what we can do with it are one way of getting a handle on what it is, what it means to be, to be quantum information. So uh, in, in my talk, I'm going to, to, to focus on, on what we can do in a concrete way. But in the process, I hope to chip away at this larger question of, what does it mean to be, uh, for information to be quantum? So I, I say quantum, of course, by contrast with classical, which, which uh, Krista did a nice introduction of. And the idea of a classical bit is something that can be two states. And so when you put together n of them, there can be two to the n states. And the crucial idea of computing is to abstract away from the physical realization of that bit. Could be RAM, could be a hard drive, could be a bead on an abacus. We heard yesterday that it could be DNA. The principles of computing are independent of that. And until quantum computing, all these different forms of computing were in a sense equivalent to each other. So we heard that if you humans that know different languages think about things in different ways, computers do not. One language can, can simulate another language. Um, until quantum computing, all the different forms of computing were equivalent. Uh, and quantum computers are a, um, are a form of computing that's different. But again, we can abstract away from the, the hardware fundamentals. So nuclear spin, photon polarization, the excited states of an ion, et cetera. All of these uh, are qubit, can be, can be made into qubits. And then once, you ha once you've done that, you can just reason about the qubit without needing to know a separate theory of quantum computing for photons and for topological excitations. So the same kind of idea uh, helps us build quantum computers. And it's interesting that this only really came about once classical computers had, had come into society. I mean, there was no reason after we learned the basics of quantum mechanics in the 30s, we couldn't have come up with this. But it was somehow the, tech, the technology of computers that really prompted it. And the promise comes from the fact that one qubit is two dimensions, and n qubits uh, has to be rep So one qubit is represented by a two-dimensional vector. Uh, n qubits are represented by a two to the n dimensional vector. And so this is sort of the, 
the fundamental exponential difference between uh, what a quantum state can do and, and what a classical computer can do. This is why Feynman observed that if you want to simulate uh, a, ob a quantum object with n parts, it takes a classical computer an effort exponential in that number of parts, but somehow a rock can simulate itself. And so, you know, what is the rock doing that our supercomputers can't? Well, it's evolving according to the laws of quantum mechanics, and so if we can make a computer that did the same thing, then we could maybe capture that benefit. And what does it mean to evolve according to the laws of quantum mechanics? There's one key equation, which is the Schrodinger equation, uh, it's a differential equation that says the way that the state evolves over time is according to this uh, equation, which is the state gets multiplied by a giant matrix, which is called a Hamiltonian. And that is really the one law that governs quantum mechanics, and this tells you how this giant two to the n dimensional vector evolves in time. And it's not so hard to go from this to developing quantum gates, like the ones that, that Krista talked about. And before I go on, I want to say one thing about, about this apparent advantage of quantum computing. It looks like the exponential size of these vectors is what gives it its power. But I want to argue today that things are a little bit more subtle than that, because we've actually seen exponentially large vectors in another setting in computing. So if you have a normal computer that can flip random coins, um, actually now I'm looking at what's on the pennies, but uh, if you can a computer with random bits, whatever they are, uh, can the state of that computer, if it's an n-bit computer, the state of it is a probability distribution over all the two to the n possible states of that computer. So that probability distribution is a vector of length two to the n. And so again, you can access exponentially large vectors without needing to, uh, you know, figure out how a nanowire works. Uh, now, this is not just a, an abs a, a theoretical idea. This is widely used in practice. So if you want to estimate a high dimensional integral, if you naively discretize your space, the number of points will be exponential. And so the way we estimate it is with sampling. So we have this exponentially large space, and we sample points in it. And so with randomness, we can speed up this calculation a lot. And Krista mentioned ENIAC. Uh, there was a period when ENIAC was shut down and moved to its final location. It was offline for almost a year. And uh, Fermi, that's the physicist other than Feynman, uh, got impatient and uh, he wanted to do a neutron scattering experiment. I think he was trying to build one of the horsemen of the apocalypse. And uh, so what he built was something called the Fermiac, which is a mechanical trolley. Uh, and the way you simulate, and it has, you roll dice to see how far it goes. You have a switch that flips between fast and slow neutrons, and you rotate it at random. Here you plot its progress. And this is a way of simulating uh, neutron scatterings, at least in two-dimensional bomb geometries. This only worked on paper. Uh, and this was a, a Monte Carlo randomized simulation. He didn't sum over all of the large possible ways of neutron scattering. He just sampled from them, them randomly. And so this is the principle behind a lot of successful randomized computation. So I'll argue that it's not just the exponential size, but there's something more that quantum computers have beyond just the exponentially large vectors that gives them their power. So I'll, I'll exhibit this with a few examples. So one example of what quantum computers can do that to me is pretty striking given how little information it seems to have is unstructured search. If you have a function f and the output, let's just be simple, the output of the function is always 0 or 1, you'd like to find some input where the output is equal to 1. So uh, what do you do? You evaluate the function on some input, let's say 0, you get the output 0. You output on 1, you get output 0. You output on 2, output 0. You think, well, maybe I'll jump around. You output on 17, you get the answer 0. You output on 132, the answer is 0. And you have, you're getting no information. As soon as you get any information, you've solved the problem. As soon as you find a 1, you're already done. Until then, you get nothing. And so you basically, if you have n inputs, you're going to need time that scales with n. And it seems like a quantum computer has very little to sink its hooks into here. Uh, but in 96, Love Grover showed that you could do it in time that scales with root n. This is not an exponential speed up, but I think it's still remarkable given how little information the quantum computer seems to have to work with. And if I had to give some intuition for why this is true, if you want to go from quantum amplitudes to classical probabilities, the, the formula is that you take the absolute value and square them. So, when, so quantum amplitude, so a classical probability distribution that's uniform would be 1 over n in each entry, a quantum state that's a uniform superposition would be 1 over square root of n, 
And so it's this gap between amplitudes and probabilities that accounts for this square root. And we see the same thing with light, for example. So the amount of power in a beam of light goes like the square of the amplitude. Or if you have something that's oscillating, the amount of energy in that oscillation is the square of, of how far the, the pendulum swings. So this is, gives you some idea of why quantum mechanics could, could lead to advantage. And in fact, this similar idea applies to many unstructured or semi-structured problems. If you want to maximize a function, you want to find uh, a collision of two inputs leads to the same thing. Uh, if you want to know who's going to win a game like chess by searching a game tree, all these things, quantum computers can get a similar kind of polynomial advantage. Krista mentioned that there's an exponential advantage for the problem of factoring uh, due to Shor's algorithm. I'll mention one further thing, which is that it breaks uh, all of the other public key crypto systems currently in use. Um, and I think this is a, a big motivation for studying quantum computing. Obviously, this is going to be a big pain, maybe not a horseman of the apocalypse, but it's going to make your cell phone battery bigger as we switch to, uh, to new crypto systems. But these new crypto systems that are hopefully quantum resistant, the only reason we think they're quantum resistant is that people haven't come up with quantum algorithms yet. But factoring is something that we had studied since the time of Euclid. And quantum algorithms for lattice crypto systems, a very, very small number of people, and probably were not very intellectually diverse or that bright, have thought about. And so uh, to gain more confidence in whether these new crypto systems are going to be secure, I think it's pretty urgent that we n investigate quantum algorithms before we start rolling out the next version of, of credit cards. I'll mention one other quantum algorithm, uh, which is to solve a large linear system of equations. So AX equals B, uh, A is a giant matrix, B is a giant vector, and you want to find X. Uh, how long did it take? So classically, your runtime for sure is going to, to scale with n, the dimension of the vector, because you just have to output n numbers. There's no way to get around that. Quantumly, you can store n amplitudes in a state of log n qubits. So it's possible you could do this much faster. And we can show that in some conditions, so for some well-behaved matrices, you can do this. Uh, and in, in some cases, you can get a, an exponential quantum advantage here. And this has seen application since then to solving differential equations, machine learning, all the things that we use linear systems of equations for. And as Krista said, the applications here are kind of, in some ways, still speculative. We have them in theory, but to actually apply them to a practical problem is something that people are, are still working on. So this is what we can do in theory. So what can we do in practice? And here, we, there are two main approaches to quantum computing. So you heard about. Uh, a, a very in, intriguing strategy that Sergey was talking about is using topological degrees of freedom to protect a qubit. And I would say this belongs to the conventional approach to quantum computing, which is to build not more qubits right away, but to get one or two clean qubits. So if you've heard about progress in quantum computing and you heard we had five qubits a decade ago, you know, why don't we have more today? It's because researchers are not trying to build more qubits. They're trying to make our qubits more reliable. And so this plot is uh, the ratio of the these operations per error. So how many quantum gates can you do per lifetime of a qubit? And this has been steadily increasing over the years. This is for superconductors, but similar plots apply to other architectures. And the reason why people focus on this is that if you can do 10 operations, if this, if this number is 10, you can do 10 operations before your qubit decoheres. And if the number is 100, you can do 100 operations before your qubit decoheres. But at a certain threshold, depends on your architecture, maybe 1,000 or 10,000, you can do an unlimited number of operations. And that's because you can correct errors faster than they accumulate. So this is called the threshold for fault-tolerant quantum computing. And current experiments have just started to reach this threshold. And so now the next step will be to either get well above it and or to scale these up. And so there are many groups that are confident they'll have 50 qubit quantum computers in the next, in the next few years. And I've listed here. Uh, only companies, there are many universities as well, but I think what's encouraging that there are big companies and startup companies is that, you know, it's easy for me to predict that we'll have quantum computers soon, but there are people who've actually bet their own money uh, on the fact that there will be a quantum computer yielding a return for them in the next five to ten years. And so you should probably trust that more than predictions of, of academics like me. Uh, so I, I find this, this pretty encouraging. Um, there's another approach which you may have heard of which is from the company D-Wave, which says, let's not wait for things to be clean. Let's just throw down a bunch of noisy qubits uh, 
and see what they do. And while I'm skeptical of this approach, I have to admit that it's, it's bold and it's generating surprises. You know, I, I don't know what this is going to do. A lot of quantum computing experiments, at the end of the experiment, all you know is that the Schrodinger equation is true and that the experimentalists are very impressive at, at what they're doing. Uh, <laughs> but with D-Wave, I really don't know what these thousand noisy qubits are going to do. I don't think they're going to solve uh, hard problems, but you know, I, I can't prove that. And so part of what I'll tell you about is, is work where I've attempted to put my, my money where my, my mouth is. Uh, and I guess they're not only noisy, but they, they run only one particular algorithm. So I'll, I'll tell you in a minute about, about, about what that algorithm is. And what that algorithm is, and also I think what a lot of the ideas are for what we'll do with near-term quantum computers, uh, involve common, problems of combinatorial optimization. And combinatorial really just means many variables. So you want to optimize some function of many variables. Let's just say these are all bits, but it doesn't really matter. And it's, let's say, uh, the function is the sum of terms, each involving a few variables. So this is super general. It encompasses almost anything you can think of. Protein folding, finding the best model, uh, ex explaining some observed data. Um, if you want to have a math proof with the fewest errors. And actually, you can see from these applications that in some cases, an approximate answer is OK. And in some, like the math proof, you really, it wouldn't be impressive if I gave you a proof of the Riemann hypothesis with only three errors. You know, you probably, you probably wouldn't find that convincing. Uh, but in others, approximate answers are, are just fine. This is a very general problem, and since it's very general, it's very hard. In general, there can be exponentially many local minima, and it's NP-complete, which means uh, that it's, you know, even if you look at one particular problem and you think this problem might be easy, you can often show that it's equivalent to all the other hard problems that other people have, have been stumped by. So uh, these problems, in general, can be quite hard. Uh, and what I'll talk about in the rest of the talk are three different approaches to solving them. So one classical, or rather the classical approaches, and some of the new quantum approaches to try to solve these, these hard combinatorial optimization problems. Um, OK, so the classical approaches, the one of, and, and I, let me just say, I have to tell you about the classical approaches because we already have classical computers, right? So the value proposition of quantum computers has to be that they're better than classical computers. So anytime you ever talk about a quantum algorithm, you have to say, here's something which classical computers get stuck at, and we, have to, and we can go beyond that. So we have to always first talk about what classical computers do. One approach, which is, I think, a very nice and, and general one, is just local search. You want to minimize some function. You just pick some point somehow, x, and then you look at the neighbors of x. Uh, you know, try to flip one bit or move a little bit in your space. And if it's better, go with the, the neighbor. If it's not better, then don't and try a different neighbor. And eventually, you'll stop because you reach a local minimum and no direction leads to an improvement. And the problem, of course, some functions have a lot of local minima. Uh, and sometimes you just get stuck very quickly and you're very far from the global optimum. So uh, it's a good first attempt, but it's not great. And to get around the local minima, I'll describe two different methods. So there's one that's classical that's based on adding entropy to say, well, let's add some noise into this. Let's bounce around randomly. So let's use randomness. And then the quantum approach is to use superposition. So a quantum state is this, you know, this giant vector, which you can think of as there's some amplitude in all these different bit strings. And that's called a superposition over these bit strings. Maybe we can encourage the quantum state to not concentrate on one bit string, but to spread out over many of them. So that's sort of a quantum approach that's analogous to the classical randomized one. So what's the randomized one? Uh, one of the leading approaches is simulated annealing. And what the idea here is we interpret this function, which we want to minimize, as an energy. And we add a temperature parameter. And the way that energy and temperature interact is the system would prefer to be in a lower energy state. And the temperature tells us how much it prefers that. If the temperature is very low, it strongly prefers to be in a low energy state. If the temperature is very high, it doesn't really care. All the states can be equally likely or almost equally likely. And it's easy to sample from a high temperature state, and so you can do that. And then you can design a process which will eventually converge at each temperature, and you gradually, in annealing, you gradually lower the temperature and hope that you don't get stuck. And so this is rock candy, which you make by uh, slowly lowering the temperature of, uh, of some sugar dissolved in water. And this will hopefully find its lowest energy state, which is the crystal configuration. So we use this all the time in practice to get systems to find their, their low energy states. And on computers, it, it often works pretty well. OK, so that's what classical computers do. 
let's compare uh, what quantum computers do. And I have to apologize. So yesterday, we, we saw some grisly images. Uh, and today, I'm going to show you some things you may not want to see. So if you're, a, if you're a surgeon, you should look down for the next 45 <laughs> seconds. Um, <laughs> and so, um, OK, so I, I want to, I've been just talking about the Hamiltonian in a, as, as this giant matrix. I want to talk about how to translate that into physics. So it's a giant matrix. It has eigenvectors. Uh, and these correspond to quantum states. These are vectors, and so quantum states are giant vectors. It has eigenvalues. These are real numbers. They correspond to the energies of those states, which, which Sergei talked about. We're often interested in the lowest energy. So like for an atom uh, at room temperature, it'll probably be in its lowest energy state. That's called the ground state. And now Schrodinger's equation, you can interpret and say, oh, the, it oscillates with a frequency corresponding to the energy. So this is why in quantum mechanics, we say energies are the same as frequencies. So every state, every eigenstate is picking up a phase at a rate given by its, its energy. And so if you have two states with uh, different energies, then they pick up phases at different rates. And uh, in some cases, that can suppress transitions between them. Um, and so this is the idea of the adiabatic algorithm. So the adiabatic algorithm, you start with some initial Hamiltonian, and you slowly adapt it, uh, slowly modify it to a final Hamiltonian. And you start in the ground state of the initial Hamiltonian. And the idea is this is something that's easy to repair and simple. And you hope that, and you set it up so that the ground state of the final Hamiltonian corresponds to the solution of your problem. So the minimum of your function or whatever your desired output is. And the adiabatic theorem says that if you slow, change your Hamiltonian slowly enough and you start in the ground state, then you will roughly stay in the ground state of the final system. Uh, classically, it's, you know, an example is if you're swinging a pendulum and you move it quick and you jerk it, then it'll mess up the pendulum's uh, oscillations. But if you move the, if, if you carry the pendulum very slowly, then it will, it will preserve its, its oscillations. And the technical condition for when this is possible depends on the, the eigenvalues of, of the Hamiltonians along the way. Um, but it's, you know, in, in many cases, it's, it's possible. So what does this have to do with, with combinatorial optimization? So what we'll do is we'll start with the Hamiltonian, which is like a magnetic field pointing in the horizontal direction. And so if you have little spins that are ma little magnets, then they all want to, the ground state is they all align with that field. And you end with a complicated Hamiltonian that has some interactions that represent the function that you want to minimize. And so the minimum energy configuration of that, uh, so the ground state, or the minimum energy of that, is going to be some pattern of ups and downs that correspond to the minimum of your function. OK, so if this, is, if this works, if this condition about the eigenvalue gap, which is just quite hard to check if that, if that is satisfied, then you can evolve from this initial state, which is all spins to the right, to this final state, which encodes a solution to your problem. So this is a, um, OK, so this is the idea of, of adi combinatorial optimization by adiabatic evolution. And in some ways, it's like simulated annealing in that you are trying at every point to find the lowest energy state. And this represents some kind of compromise between these two different terms. The final term wants you just to get the lowest energy. But this first term doesn't want your spins to point up or down. It wants them to point to the right, which is like a superposition of up and down. Uh, and so compromising between these two terms means y your state is trying to compromise between zeroing in on the lowest energy and spreading its amplitude out over many different configurations. Just like simulated annealing, you're trying to compromise between lowering the energy and bouncing around, you know, increasing your entropy, bouncing around between many different configurations. So they're similar, but do they perform the same way? And there's some evidence from physics that they don't. So in the sun, uh, nuclear reactions wouldn't happen if we just had classical physics. The reason why they happen is because the wave functions of the, of the particles in the sun are quantum mechanically kind of smeared out. And the only way they can get close enough, they can overcome their repulsion and get close enough for fusion, is with quantum tunneling, which means uh, that their smeared out wave functions can, can penetrate through this is a, a potential energy barrier so they can get to this, this lowest energy configuration when they're, when they're right next to each other. And this was actually, um, this settled a big scientific debate. People from evolution thought the Earth should be hundreds of millions of years old or older. But if you look at the sun and you didn't know about tunneling, there was no way it could be older than tens of thousands of years. So it was a big, uh, big paradox, which was, which was only resolved with, uh, with quantum mechanical tunneling. So 
if natural systems can find their minimum with, um, uh, with tunneling, can we do this with the adiabatic algorithm? So you can show it, I'll show you a toy example of this. This works in, in more realistic problems, but you can cook up a toy example where you can see this. So if your uh, potential, your, the function you're trying to minimize looks like this, and there's some giant local minimum here, uh, then under some circumstances, the adiabatic algorithm can tunnel through this. And in fact, uh, you can show, so here's another example of this potential, uh, for some sizes of the potential, if the barrier, if the area under this, this barrier is not too large, the adiabatic algorithm, and I've simulated this in the top part here, will tunnel through it, whereas in this middle part, I've shown the probability distribution for simulated annealing, and you see it gets stuck. So here's where the barrier is, the probability just piles up, and it gets more and more probability being right next to the barrier, but it refuses to step onto the barrier. So it's, uh, it'll take an exponential amount of time to go through the barrier, whereas adiabatic can get through it uh, because of, of quantum mechanical tunneling. So this is, is pretty exciting, um, and D-Wave is, is selling their quantum computers based on this idea. This is from their marketing slide from their website. It says classical algorithms can only walk over the landscape, quantum computers can tunnel to find the lowest point, uh, and D-Wave gets this to work. Um, and so in the very first talk of this conference, we heard that, that people don't want to hear about negative results, they just want to hear about positive results. Um, so I hope you don't mind that I'm going to tell you a, a negative result, that things are not quite as good as this sounds. Um, and the reason is, if you look at the Hamiltonian here, it turns out, when you write it down, all the off-diagonals are non-positive. Uh, which, okay, why does that matter? Um, physicists call this sign problem free, or also stochastic which is like stochastic, but we just like to put cues in everything. So it's, <laughs> it's stochastic. And what that means is that it's not hard to show that the ground state has only non-negative entries. But quantum states in general can have complex numbers for entries. What does it mean that they only have non-negative entries? It means that the interference that we would normally expect cannot occur. So normally we have constructive and destructive interference. Destructive interference requires you know, you interfere a positive with a negative amplitude. But if all the amplitudes are not negative, you're not going to get that. And so one implication of this is that we can map our quantum Hamiltonian onto an equivalent classical system. This is called, this procedure is called quantum Monte Carlo. Uh, despite the name, it's not a quantum algorithm, it's a classical algorithm. Uh, it was invented in the 70s before, before uh, quantum computers were around. And one result with my former student Elizabeth Crossan is that when the adiabatic algorithm can quickly tunnel through, so can quantum Monte Carlo, which I emphasize is a classical algorithm. So the idea is quantum Monte Carlo represents your quantum state by this rectangle of, of bits. And if you look at each row, so here I've plotted the weight of each row, and here this dashed blue line is the barrier. The evolution of quantum Monte Carlo, there's some kind of path that evolves over time. And this path, so simulated annealing would get stuck because to step on this barrier would be exponentially forbidden. But if you have a path which is wiggling around, the whole path doesn't have to sit on the barrier all at once. Little pieces of it can go through. And so it doesn't feel the barrier as much. It's kind of like the way the quantum state is smeared out with superposition and doesn't feel the, the barrier as much. The quantum Monte Carlo can take advantage of this as well. So um, here's all three, the three things. And actually, I've, I was told to have not too many acronyms. So uh, let me replace that. So this is simulated annealing was the first algorithm. So what have we done? We started with a classical algorithm. Simulated annealing fails. We made a quantum version. Quantum adiabatic optimization uh, succeeds, right? It gets through the barrier. Then. We said, actually, you can simulate this with a classical algorithm, uh, quantum Monte Carlo, which, which now succeeds. So what seemed to be a, a promising quantum speedup uh, now does not look so, so promising. So uh, I said, I'll talk about what can we do with a quantum computer. This is something which so far is maybe not looking like a promising use of, of near-term quantum computers. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think it, it was interesting to see. and it's, it's not, does not totally rule out adiabatic optimization. There may be other things we can do, but it suggests that tunneling is not going to be one of those applications. Uh, now, I didn't enter this field to only find negative things about quantum computing, so, you know, <laughs> what's something good that we can do with them? 
And the last thing I'll talk about are variational algorithms and this goal of quantum supremacy, which is, means doing something on a quantum computer that you cannot do on a classical computer. Sort of a, a milestone that, even if it's not directly useful, would give motivation for building larger quantum computers. And there's one nice class of variational quantum algorithms uh, which does the following. You want to try to find the minimum of your function. And so before I said one way we could do it is to adiabatically interpolate the Hamiltonian. So that can sometimes be simulated. But here's a very simple variant. Instead of interpolating, just try one Hamiltonian, the magnetic field to the right, then do the other one, the complicated interactions. Then try the other one for a bit, and then go bounce back and forth a few times, and do this not too many times, let's say five or 10 times. Uh, and then search over the values of these times. So try, if, you know, do a local search, try and improve, improve these times. So this is a, a, a very simple quantum algorithm for optimization problems or for doing things like Krista was talking about, of trying to find the ground state of some physical system. You can use it for, for that as well. And you might ask, this is so simple, can you simulate it with a classical computer? So if I have a, a randomized computer, takes some random bits, does some processing, spits out a sample, can you simulate it? Uh, and you can prove that you can't. Uh, subject to some assumptions in complexity theory, the uh, outputs of the quantum algorithm, even though it's quite simple, even if you just do T1 and then T2 and then stop, so you just do a very uh, short run of it, it's hard to simulate classically. So this is, I think, a very promising thing to do because it takes very short amount of time on a quantum computer. Um, OK, so let me, let me close by, by saying uh, quantum computers are, are a technology that has some promise, but I don't know fully what they're, why they work and why they achieve their benefits. It's sort of like when I was a kid, carburetors were an example of, of such a technology. Uh, this is um, Calvin asks his dad why they work. And he says, I can't tell you. Calvin's dad says, why not? His dad says, it's a secret. And Calvin says, no, it isn't. You just don't know. And so that's, you know, for quantum computers, why, why do they get their advantage? Uh, you know, I'd like to tell you it's a secret, but I have to admit, I, I don't really know. So I do know, and what I've hoped to convince you is that the exponentially large dimension is not enough. You need interference as well. And with these variational algorithms, even though they're very short, they do have minus signs in their amplitudes, so you get interference. Uh, and I think it's a fascinating question to keep on trying to dig into what can they do better than classical computers, and what can't they? And in the process, what can we learn about the nature of quantum information uh, and, and what quantum mechanics means for information computing? Okay, thanks for your attention.